Hello? Okay. All right. So we're going to take a little stroll through the woods today um, while talking about advertising research. Um, first, I'd like to take you back as we're talking about advertising research um, back to the good old days when advertising consisted of a television commercial. So you could produce your television commercial, run it on one, two, or all three of the networks, and be um, assured that if people weren't actually watching it, at least they were in the room exposed to your television commercial. And so research, advertising research back in those days was a lot simpler. The question was, are people actually remembering your television commercial? Is it changing their mind? Is it getting them to go buy the product? However, things, as we all know, have evolved a lot uh, in the last a number of years, uh, particularly in the last five or ten years, the media environment has gotten incre increasingly complex. In today's environment, really is more like um, the consumer is strolling through the woods. So if the woods are all of your brand engagements that you have out there, these brand exposures that uh, people are passing by, some of them they're noticing, some of them they're not, but at the end of the day, the sense that comes through about your brand is the sense that is, is gathered from all of these different engagements out of the corner of the eye, the ones, the trees that they actually stop and gaze at. So it's not so much a matter of evaluating a single commercial or a single brand exposure anymore as it is evaluating how all of these brand interactions impact on, on how the consumer thinks about the brand. So the challenge for advertising <coughs> researchers has become both how to see the, for, the trees and the forest. So the individual tree, that individual commercial, that individual ad, what's it doing for your brand? But how are all the brand interactions working together, the entire forest of brand experiences uh, impacting on how consumers perceive your brand, the brand affinity, um, and, and those other connections that we're trying so hard to build with all of our advertising communications. So that's my stroll through the woods. We'll come back to the woods at the end. I'd like to introduce Casey Doster, who's our VP of Account Services, who's going to bring it back to real life to the advertising research community. So um, when we think about the different approaches there are out there, when we think about campaign effectiveness, is a campaign working, um, there's two basic um, sides of the approach. One is to measure a single ad at a time. So in Jerry's forest metaphor, this is studying an individual tree. Um, so there's a lot of uh, methodologies out there that are based on exposure opportunities, exposed or not exposed to any individual ad. Um, you get a sense for how that individual ad is working, um, but you don't really know how it's interacting with the rest of the forest and all of the other potential brand interactions that a uh, consumer might be having. The second approach is um, the entire campaign. So a lot of these traditional continuous tracking methodologies that are asking, you know, have you seen any advertising for Cheerios lately? Um, but they're not really able to understand um, what's going on inside of that campaign. Um, you might get a sense for overall brand measures are going up and maybe awareness of the campaign is going up. Um, but you don't know within that campaign um, what's driving those brand measures, how the individual channels are working, or even how the individual ads are working. Um, the other problem with these exposure opportunity methods is that we don't necessarily know whether or not an individual person has actually engaged with an ad. So depending on the media venue, um, one in four to one in ten of anyone who has an exposure opportunity to an ad will actually pay attention to it. Um, and that's even a bigger problem when we think about TV and all of the second screen distractions and with digital, a huge problem with banner blindness and even having the digital ad visible on screen even though they might have had an exposure opportunity. We don't know whether or not it was even visible or if they even paid attention to it given all of the banner blindness. Um, so these exposure opportunity methods are actually pretty good for evaluating the different media channels if you're thinking about um, which shows to buy, which channels to buy, which sites to buy on. Um, you can get pretty granular for individual executions in the media buy, um, but not so good for a di diagnosing the creative um, because we don't know whether or not people are actually paying attention. Um, so it doesn't give you a lot of feedback on the creative itself. 
Um, and finally, these um, que the questioning after ad engagement. So when we try to get to is a campaign working, it's really important to understand whether or not that campaign is having an impact on the brand. Is it persuading consumers? So there's a lot of methodologies out there um, that go in after the fact. They interview people who are either exposed or not exposed or aware or not aware, look at differences in brand measures among those different people. Um, but it doesn't address what we call a communicative selective perception. And that's just that if you're more favorable towards a brand, you're more likely to be paying attention to that brand's advertising. So if I'm already thinking about buying a BMW, I'm going to be the one paying attention to that BMW commercial when it comes on. So it's really difficult to separate out which came first. Did I love the brand and so I paid attention to the commercial, or did the commercial make me love the brand? Um, and finally, relying on consumer claimed persuasion, did this commercial impact your purchase intentions for the brand, is really difficult um, and an unreliable measure, especially when we get to the more emotional brand metrics. So this is not just about driving sales, but about building brand affinity, building brand love, and long-term brand value. You can't necessarily just ask a consumer um, those questions and rely, be able to rely on responses. Um, so the solution that we've found to be effective over the past um, 50 plus years and have evolved based on the changing media environment is based on a longitudinal research design. Um, so essentially there's two critical components of this design. Um, number one is the fact that it's longitudinal. So we're interviewing the same people before and after advertising launches. We find out how they feel about the brand before and after. And then after, um, the second critical component of this is figuring out which channels and which media and which specific ads that they've engaged with. Um, so really important here um, in sorting all of that out is a, um, a reliable method for who's seen what ads. So we use a proven um, memory trigger and certification procedure that involves limited recognition cues. It's media neutral, so it's based on how the memory is stored in the brain for any given media channel. So for television commercials, we trigger the experience, the experiential memory. For visual um, static ads, it's a brief flash just to trigger that <coughs> visual memory of the ad. Um, so with this, we're able to sort out who has seen what within a campaign across all of the different media channels, and then we know how they've changed over time in terms of their brand metrics. So back in the old days, it was really simple to sort out these cross-channel effects. Essentially, we grouped people into different groups. Maybe a campaign, a simple campaign back in the old days would be a print and uh, television campaign. So we would sort people into the groups. There's, here, here's a group of people who've only seen print, so you go stand over there. There's a group of people who've only seen TV, you go stand over there. Um, and then there's a group who's seen both TV and print and a group who didn't see anything within the campaign. So essentially we have these different groups of people that we can sort out. And based on those groups, we can look at changes over time so that people who didn't see the advertising that serves as your self-selecting control group. Um, so we look at what happened over time among people who didn't see advertising, what happened over time among people who only saw print, um, you can see maybe there was it was mitigating declines that would have been happening uh, without advertising, whereas TV, you're actually getting a lift. But if they see both TV and print, you get the best effects um, of the campaign on any, any given brand KPI. So this is a really simple example um, that worked really well when campaigns were simple. Um, but today we know campaigns are not simple. Um, there's a huge variety of media channels and more emerging every day um, that if we were just to group those people into the different groups and have them stand in different places, we'd have millions of combinations. Um, so this is where advanced analytics comes in and um, more advanced modeling approaches. We have Trevor Kavarin, who's our VP of advanced analytics, uh, to, some, to talk about some of those approaches. Hi, so I want to talk about what do we do when we have this increasingly complex media world. We really still want to understand it. We want to be able to use this nice longitudinal data that we have. How do we actually address these sorts of problems? And I'm going to take you through a couple examples that we uh, of ways that we've really approached this from an analytical perspective. A couple of different strategies that we've taken. 
So one thing that we've done is we really employ a lot of uh, hierarchical multi-level models that allow us to uh, model out both those traditional effects that Casey was talking about. More like the typical analysis you'd see, what happens when you see television, what happens when you see print. Uh, but also allows us to look at these interactive effects, these smaller effects that occur within a campaign that are really, I think, an important element of the analysis that a lot of people leave out when they start trying to understand how their campaigns are working, how their elements uh, of their campaigns are working. So in this particular example, we had a campaign that had print, and video, it also had a significant uh, contribution of social, in-store, radio, online video, and out-of-home advertising. And what we found in this particular campaign is if we had applied this sort of traditional analysis, we would have found that print and video had a nice, robust impact on brand perceptions and brand usage. That's important to know. Those effects are, are legitimate and true and continue to be important for us to understand. But we also need to look for these secondary effects, these smaller effects. Oftentimes we think of them as amplification effects uh, that come in from media combinations. So these can often be ignored in the more traditional analysis. But with the sort of multi-level hierarchical models that we use, we can capture them quite, uh, quite confidently. So these amplification effects really give us the ability to say, when you add a media type on top of the rest of a campaign, does it bolster the campaign? And we can oftentimes see that even for media types that don't have a direct impact that you would see through a traditional analysis, we find these smaller effects, these amplification effects, which are oftentimes critical to understanding the overall effect of a campaign. So in this particular analysis, we, we ran through this amplification analysis and found that while video has a really nice, robust, direct effect, it doesn't add anything additional in terms of amplifying the other media types that are working within the uh, campaign. However, when we look at social, what we find is that social has this robust amplification effect where when you add in your social on top of the rest of your campaign, we really saw this expansion of the way that the campaign was working in terms of impacting brand perceptions and brand usage. We think this is a really critical piece that many, uh, many uh, research methodologies ignore are these amplification <coughs> effects. Without it, this is what your overall impact looks like. Once we can model in those additional amplification effects, we see that some of those smaller ones that you might have been ignoring tend to pop up as still providing a return, still being important elements within your campaign. But we can go farther than that. So another question that you might have about your campaign that we can handle with some of the, with a, with a more advanced analytical methods is trying to understand, do people really engage with our campaign in the way that we often think that they do, right? Oftentimes we think about campaign engagement in terms of maybe the way that we're paying for our advertising, right? Maybe we expect our video to work together maybe because we're paying for it out of the same uh, budget item. In this particular uh, campaign, we had five video elements. We had digital that had some digital that was focused more on brand messaging, some that was focused more on sort of call to action or more emotional messaging. Also had a direct to consumer element, a store display, and a couple social media elements that they were using. And we really wanted to know, does the campaign fall out in the way that they would expect? Is there a neat video bucket? Is there a neat digital bucket? Does social media uh, work by itself? How, or how are these things actually engaged with by the consumer? And what we found using a, a matrix factorization technique, it's a multivariate method that we use uh, quite often, uh, that we were able to come up with a nice two cluster solution here for this client. We found that their video and that brand message focused digital tended to go together, tended to form a nice cluster within the data. Whereas those call to action video, uh, digital, along with that direct to consumer store display and social media, formed a second distinct cluster within our data. So now we know that naturally out among our consumers, they're engaging with our media in a specific way. There are these two different clusters that tend to work together, sort of like naturally occurring campaigns. 
We can take a step beyond just understanding that these two clusters exist to now ask how are different groups of consumers engaging with those two clusters. So here we use a, a more traditional hierarchical clustering method. And we found that for this client, there were really two groups of consumers within our sample. Those individuals who we thought of as highly engaged, those were individuals who tended to engage both with that cluster one, that more traditional video and brand messaging digital, but also with the rest of the digital campaign, the social. Really, these people were engaging broadly with the entire campaign that the advertiser was trying to put out there. But we found this second cluster of individuals. These individuals were much more directly focused, more selectively focused on that, uh, that sort of new media campaign that they had, the, the social campaign, the direct consumer stuff. Uh, so now we know something about who it is that's seeing these different clusters, right? How are uh, people engaging and who are the people that are engaging in different ways? And when we looked at demographic information about these groups, things really started to make sense in terms of how this campaign was working and uh, how it was working differently among different groups. What we found was that highly engaged group actually tended to be our older, more higher income individuals. Whereas our selectively engaged group was really a pretty millennial focused uh, group of individuals. So our millennial targets were really our cord cutters focused on social and the other new media techn uh, techniques that we had in this campaign. Interestingly, here you see while we typically traditionally might have thought of video as being the sort of bridge that works across everybody, for some of these, for some advertisers, we're seeing increasingly that uh, social, uh, some of the, the new media techniques really are the ones that are bridging. We're seeing some of our older, higher income individuals uh, being engaged with the social stuff, and that also captures your millennial target. So. Once we have those different demographic groups, now we can go back, restart the whole process again, and think about how are those different individuals being engaged, uh, being impacted on brand messaging, on uh, favorability, and on behavior at those different levels of the purchase funnel, right? And what we found was that highly engaged group were getting very strongly impacted on their brand messaging, right? All of that brand messaging digital, that video is doing a really great job for this advertiser of pushing through the messages that they were trying to get out there. And that was cycling down into increasing impact on favorability and on behavior, ultimately. What we found with our selectively engaged group, this is a pretty interesting effect, I think, is that they really weren't getting driven on brand messaging at all. We weren't seeing an impact on brand messaging uh, from this advertiser for this group of individuals. But we did see uh, some impact on favorability and behavior. And what we worry about in a case like this is that the spigot sort of has to always be turned on in terms of this social and these new media technologies, right? Because you're not focusing here on brand messaging, uh, these favorability and behavioral effects are likely to be slightly less long-lasting in terms of their impact on behavior. You're going to see these erode quickly among this demographic in a way that the, uh, this highly engaged group, more uh, traditional group, we are uh, likely to see this impact persist a little bit longer uh, into the future. And with that, I'm going to turn over to Jerry. Thanks. <laughs> So you can see how this kind of analysis um, can inform decisions on how to think about the different elements within the advertising campaign. In that last example, we can see that an advertiser who is focusing on the bottom of the funnel brand metrics in terms of what's driving sales um, is going to forget that it's important to build the brand for the long term and that there's this younger group of millennials who are cord cutters who are just engaging with the more, um, the more intimate media that are, are good at getting them to buy the product but maybe not really building the brand for the long term. So in this case, those are the kinds of insights that were developed. Um, but from a research standpoint, we think that there's some important lessons to be learned from um, how we do this kind of analysis and how you can think about sorting out cross-channel um, brand communications. The first is to measure engagements 
not impressions. So we know that um, in a lot of the methodologies that are trying to uh, uh, develop a single source for you know who's engaging with the television and who's engaging with the digital and how do we put those together and how do we link that to brand sales. Um, if you're not measuring engagements, if you're only measuring exposure opportunities, you're getting some really good insights on media but the insights on how the advertising is actually working in the mind of the consumer, is it capturing their attention, is it communicating, is it building the brand in the long-term ways, that's what you're gonna miss if you don't measure engagements with advertising with specific ads. Um, secondly, to look for both direct and amplification effects. Um, I think you saw in Trevor's example how if you looked just at the direct effects, you would have said, oh, all those smaller media really aren't doing anything for my brand, I need to just concentrate on the big, the expensive, the television, those big statement media, whereas in fact among people who are seeing the television and the social, you're getting some really stronger effects of the television because they've also engaged with the social, so that we're, um, we're, we're not falling in the trap of, gee, we don't see that social is delivering an ROI for our brand, let's minimize the budget for social. Um, and thirdly, moving beyond the traditional media types, so we used to think in terms of how's the TV working, how's the digital working, how's the social working, how's the out of home working, but consumers don't see advertising in the media buckets the way we buy advertising. So to be able to look at advertising campaigns in the ways that different consumers engage with the multiple elements within a campaign um, takes us to a more of a messaging level than strictly a media level. And examining how the campaign functions at various stages along the purchase funnel. So we're not just looking at what made people buy the brand. Um, we're looking at how does how does advertising bring them all the way down the funnel? How does it make them consider maybe putting the brand on their list? And that's a really important function for advertising. That if you're just looking at the bottom of the funnel, the behavioral metrics, you're going to miss those um, important communications dynamics that are gonna build your brand for the long term. So looking at all of these things um, can provide better insights about how today's campaign is working, um, but equally importantly, um, giving you greater ability to be develop future advertising that connects and persuades. So we know we're in the right media channels, but we also know that we have the messages that are connecting, the messages that are building the brand all the way from the top of the funnel down to that purchase decision across different types of consumers. So that brings us back to the forest and the trees. So we think we can not ignore the individual trees because each communications element can be important within your campaign, but also understanding how it all works together to give consumers a sense of the brand and the brand affinity and the brand love that will ultimately relate in, uh, translate into brand sales. Thank you very much. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions if anybody has any. Yes. So you mentioned that the case study that you used, uh, that was one to your study, mm -hmm. and then you came out with different clusters. So did you, in the very beginning, make sure that you used a sample that has very diverse uh, people demographically, or how did you ensure that you basically yes, have? Yes, absolutely. We right. typically, our studies will include a broad cross-section of consumers that are within the target for that brand. So if your target is, um, you know, adult, who, adults who are beer drinkers will get a cro broad cross-section of them, maybe interviewing from 1,500 to 3,000 within a, a, a specific category, or it might be purchasers of a particular uh, consumer product um, to get a broad cross-section of people who are buying the brand, people who aren't buying the brand, um, all the people that are being targeted with the communications. We do these surveys online, and then we'll go back and re-contact re and re-interview those same people within a six-month, say, time frame, depending on the length of the campaign campaign so that we're getting a broad cross-section of people who might have seen the advertising and people who are in the target but might not have seen the advertising. Okay, thank you very much. We are, um, <laughs>